Hi friends, welcome to Plexus Ortho. My name is Dr. Kanan Kumar and I am your orthopedic faculty at Plexus Ortho. Today we are going to discuss the INI CET questions that were put up in November exam. So the INI CET questions are very important because they are often repeated uh, questions. They are often subjects that are repeated frequently in your exams. So you have to go through these, through these questions quite carefully so that you read the subject well and do well in these questions. A couple of these questions were a little difficult. We will go through them. Um, and uh, hopefully this helps you in uh, understanding what kind of subjects and topics are asked in the uh, INICT exams and future NEET PG exam as well. So let's straight away start off with these questions. These questions are recall based questions and therefore there may be some uh, discrepancy. Forgive me the mistakes are mine alone. I have tried to find these questions from uh, uh, the internet and other sources and therefore uh, there may be mistakes in these questions. If there are mistakes please forgive me. Okay. So let's so let's start off with the first question. The first question says a 60 year old female presents to you with a T score of uh, uh, minus 2.5 on the DEXA scan. She attained a menopause at the age of 50 and she had a distal radius fracture and uh, this happened about 8 months ago. What is the next best management? So we all know what is the difference between T score and Z score. T score is that is in relation to a 30 year old male or female patient. So they compare the DEXA scan or bone uh, mineral density with a 30 year old patient and that is called T-score and that is considered for osteoporosis uh, classification and management. So between minus 1 and plus 1 is normal, between minus 2.5 and minus 1 is osteopenia and anything less than minus 3.5 is osteoporosis. Okay, But remember any level of uh, T-score with a Coley's fracture or a fragility fracture or an osteoporotic fracture automatically becomes severe osteoporosis and in case of osteoporosis you always have to start the first choice of drug is alendronate. The first choice of drug is alendronate or bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonates have to be given. How do they work? They prevent osteoclastic activity and therefore improve bone formation. So that is the first choice of treatment. You, you have to always give calcium supplementation but that is not the only treatment. Your hormone replacement therapy and estrogen is for post-menopausal kind of porosis where this kind of uh, hormone replacement therapy helps. Repeat uh, DEXA scan after 3 months, no that is not the choice because it doesn't make, already the patient is having osteoporosis and it is severe osteoporosis because of an associated osteoporotic fracture. So the treatment of choice is a bisphosphonate. Okay. So here is basically the T-score, how do you classify the osteoporosis osteoporosis is a very important topic very frequently repeated in your exams and every exam has at least one or two questions on osteoporosis so osteoporosis should be like the back of your palm um, and you should be able to answer this uh, at all times so t score t score is a relative to normal young matched adults so a 55 year old woman's uh, uh, bone uh, mineral density is compared to a 30 year old woman's uh, density and this is called as a T-score. Z-score is age and sex appropriate. However, Z-score is not used for uh, classification system. Osteopenia is anywhere from minus 1 to minus 2.5. Anything less than minus 2.5 is called as osteoporosis. And the choice of treatment in uh, osteoporosis is bisphosphonates is the first choice of treatment. And depending on the condition, if the patient is having postmenopausal um, osteoporosis, you can use hormone replacement therapy or relaxifin. The second line of drug is teriparatide. So teriparatide is a recombinant paratha hormone, and uh, it, uh, if given interrupted fashion, that is in daily a small dose is given, it causes a bone formation, and therefore teriparatide is a second line of drug if the bisphosphonate fails. And what are the complications of bisphosphonates? You know, it can cause avascular necrosis of the jaw. It can cause severe esophagitis and that's why the patient has to take the tablet in sitting position. It can cause subtrochantric fractures, atypical subtrochantric fractures. These are the complications of bisphosphonates. Teriparatide is a second line of drug. Denusumab is also a second line of drug. It's a rank ligand inhibitor, monoclonal antibody against rank ligand and therefore it inhibits osteoclastic activity and therefore increases bone formation. Romosusumab is an anti-sclerostin antibody. It inhibits sclerostin. So sclerostin inhibits osteoblast and therefore decreases osteoblastic activity. Anything that inhibits sclerostin will increase osteoblast activity and therefore bone formation occurs. For pain we use what is called as calcitonin. It's salmon calcitonin is used for pain which occurs because of osteoporotic fractures of the spine. So multiple 
osteoporotic fractures of the spine can occur and this can cause pain to the patient and here you can give calcitonin which is given as an intranasal spray in the alternate nostrils and alternate days right of course always all these patients must be supplemented with vitamin d calcium and uh, vitamin k and these patients um, have to be given this amount of calcium and vitamin d because when newborn formation occurs you need you need these minerals right so it cannot be a stand alone treatment for severe osteoporosis so the answer for that question was the choice of drug for treatment of osteoporosis is bisphosphonate and the choice of uh, choice given in the answer was alendronate right let's go to the next question the next question was a simple straightforward uh, peripheral nerve question they were asking you the sedens classification if the outer sheath and the nerve fiber is intact but the axons are damaged what is it called okay so the answer here is axon at meses so we will discuss this in a little more detail neuropraxia is a compression of the nerve so it is a conduction block so there is no pathological damage to the nerve that is there is no cut or damage to the axon or the outer sheath or inner sheath or any of the sheaths all the sheaths are intact so this is sudden classification one neuropraxia the second one is neurotmesis where the inner axons are damaged whereas outer sheaths are intact right so the endoneurium is damaged the axon is damaged whereas the epineurium or the outer coating and perineurium the vesical coating is not damaged so this is grade 2 then you have neurotmesis which is grade 3 where there is a complete transaction of the nerve this is these are the three grades of sedens classification so let's look at briefly the anatomy of the peripheral nerve So the anatomy of the peripheral nerve, you can see it is covered by an outer sheath called epineurium. Then you have the fascicles which are covered by the perineurium. Then the individual axons are covered by the endoneurium. So here they have said that the axons are damaged, whereas the outer sheath, fiber sheath, is intact, and therefore this becomes what is called as axon or meses or damage to the axon. so when you look at uh, the microscopic structure the normal stru- normal uh, nerve and its uh, axon can be seen here right when you have the myelin sheath covering the axon and when you have a neuropraxia you have a conduction block there is just a compression the patients recover very well almost 100% of them recover all um, function uh, recovers within 3 to 6 weeks right and this is grade 1 in sedens classification and this is very commonly seen in saturday night palsy crutch palsy tonique palsy when there is a compression of the nerve when the compression is released they usually grow back and then it, uh, the conduction recovers and it happens in about 3 to 6 weeks time then you have axon at meses where the inner axon is damaged and here also the recovery is good here you have the tunnel sign because neuroma formation can occur because there is a damage to the axon and the nerve grows back at 1 mm per day all of us know this very well so it grows back at 1 mm per day or about an inch a month and then you have the progressive tunnel sign which goes uh, distally there is a motor march the muscles start recovering and this is grade 2 of uh, sedens classification the recovery may not be 100% but they usually recover and may take a few months it may take 3 to 6 weeks here in neuropraxia but here it may take 3 to 6 months then you have neurotmesis where there is a complete transection of the nerve and here you have to either do a repair so a surgical intervention is a must so you have to do a nerve repair or you will have to put nerve graft in between the um, axons or the fascicles so that they g- grow back so therefore some surgical intervention is required in neurotmesis and this is called as type 3 of sedens classification so let's go back to the question they are asking the outer sheath is intact and the nerve fiber is intact but the axons are damaged the inside endoneurium and axons are damaged and this is called as grade 2 of sedens classification or axon at meses so let's uh, come to a relatively simpler question that was asked in your november inict to 2021 exam in uh, which they asked which nerve injury causes this so you can clearly see a clawing of the finger that is there is an hyperextension of the um mcp joint and flexion of the pip and ip joints and this classically is called as claw hand if all four uh, fingers are involved it's a co- combination median and ulnar nerve palsy because the first two lumbricals are supplied by the median nerve whereas the medial two lumbricals and all the introsia are supplied by the ulnar nerve so here only two fingers are involved in the clawing and therefore it is caused by the ulnar nerve right very important so the answer to this question is ulnar nerve some what are the some of the tests that we know of so you have this is called the froman sign right 
why is uh, what is this sign or book test from and sign or book test in from and sign or book test the uh, patient is asked to hold a book and uh, the examiner also holds a book between the thumb and the index finger and the examiner pulls the book and the patient is asked to grip and not uh, allow the examiner to pull the book in normal patients they will adduct the thumb against the index finger whereas in 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 ulnar nerve palsy where the adductor pollicis muscle of the thenar group of muscles is affected the patient will flex the um, thumb instead of adducting the thumb to hold on to the book using the fpl muscle and this is called as the froman's or the book sign then you have the card test because the pad and dab you know pad palmar intraosseous are responsible for adduction and dorsal intraosseous are responsible for abduction so you use a card test card test to check for the uh, intraosseous function so you give a card to the patient and ask the patient to hold between two fingers and pull it out try pulling it out if the patient is not able to grip those two uh, fingers to the card then it indicates a ulnar nerve injury a very important concept very frequently asked is called the ulnar paradox what is the paradox the paradox is that a lower level ulnar nerve injury causes more deformity so if the nerve is affected at the level of the wrist the clawing is much more severe than the proximal level injury so a wrist level injury causes more clawing than a elbow level injury which causes less clawing and the reason for this is because the fdp is given away uh, the ring and little finger fdp is given supply by the ulnar nerve much more proximally therefore in a proximal injury even the fdp is affected and therefore the flexion of the pap and tap joint is much lesser whereas in a distal injury or a injury at the level of the wrist the fdp is spared and it is functioning and therefore the clawing is more apparent so therefore this is a paradox where the distal injury there is more deformity whereas in the proximal injury the deformity is less and this is called as ulnar paradox very frequently asked in your exams don't miss on this let's move on to the next question uh, following a femur fracture and cast application the patient was dragging his foot after the cast removal which nerve injury caused this deformity they showed you a picture and they labeled the superior gluteal nerve inferior gluteal nerve obturator nerve and the sciatic nerve right so femur fracture cast is applied is usually a child you know we don't apply a cast in an adult and it is very difficult to apply a cast so what kind of cast is applied for a femur fracture in a child it is called as a hip spica we have discussed this in detail in other videos uh, i will put a link to it so we we discuss uh, about all the various types of spicas and casts so hip spica basically there is a cast goes all around the trunk and involves both the legs are one leg and this is called a hip spica and this is the cast treatment applied for femur fractures in children so the patient was dragging his foot after cast removal the most common cause for dragging of feet is a foot drop patient is not able to dorsiflex his ankle because tibialis anterior ehl and edl is involved and usually the deep peroneal nerve or common peroneal nerve is involved and therefore uh, common peroneal nerve is a component of the sciatic nerve and uh, therefore this was the most common cause of this kind of injury is probably a sciatic nerve injury so we know that the sciatic nerve is quite a big nerve the biggest nerve in the body the central portion is the tibial nerve and the peripheral portion is a common peroneal nerve so usually the common peroneal nerve is a more commonly affected in any kind of compression or injury to the sciatic nerve so foot drop will cause this kind of an uh, problem and the most common cause of this is sciatic nerve right and uh, this is how we apply a hip spica it goes all around the trunk and both the legs can be involved or one leg can be uh, involved in the cast is usually used for femur fracture in children so what is the treatment of femur fracture in children very important has been asked frequent uh, frequently in your exams if the child is less than 6 months in age you can use what is called as a pavlic harness brace pavlic harness where else do we use pavlic harness it is used in congenital dislocation of hip in children less than 6 six, six months of age so pavlic harness is used in less than 6 months of age in 6 months to 5 years of age we use a hip spica or cast application in 5 to 11 years of age you use what is called as tens nailing titanium elastic nail system so use a ti- elastic titanium nail to hold the femur in place more than 11 years you use either a plate or you use an intramedullary interlocking nail im il nail so intramedullary nail or a plate is used after 10 or 11 years of age 
between 5 to 11 years of age you use titanium elastic nailing and between 6 months to 5 years of age you use a hip spike or cast and less than 6 months you just use a pavlic harness brace and where else is a pavlic harness brace used it is used in case of congenital dislocation of the hip now all of us know the origin of the sciatic nerve it is from l4 to s3 okay the peroneal component as i said is in the periphery whereas the tibial nerve is in the center it exits through the sciatic notch and deep to the piriformis and uh, it can get compressed here in case of casting in case of surgeries and other uh, problems so therefore the most common uh, cause of a cast followed by a foot drop is a sciatic nerve injury now next uh, was a difficult question this has not been asked previously so it's a new question and uh, i'm sure uh, if you've attended your ward rounds and others you must have seen this being done by the pgs and the consultants and therefore may not have been very difficult so they have asked you to arrange the sequence of performing the thomas test so what is the thomas test used for the thomas test is used to identify the um, flexion deformity in a hip joint so let us say this is the pelvis this is the leg this is the body and this is the head right and here is the ankle so when the patient is having a flexion deformity of the hip uh, the lumbar spine tries to compensate for it so if you want to lie down flat on the uh, cot when the leg is straight the lumbar spine goes into lordosis to compensate to keep the leg on the cot so how to uncover this so you have to make the patient lie on the cot and you have to observe the lumbar lordosis then put in your hand here i will show you the image put your hand here ask the patient to flex the normal hip or unaffected hip when you flex the unaffected hip the lumbar lordosis corrects itself and then you have to look at what is the position of the hip in the affected side and this is called as the thomas positive thomas test and this angle is called the hip flexion deformity angle hip fixed flexion deformity angle so basically thomas test uncovers the hip flexion fixed flexion deformity and here you try and correct the lumbar lordosis which is compensating for the hip flexion deformity by keeping your hand under the spine once and you flex the normal um, leg and the opposite leg will show a flexion deformity and this is what is calculated and this is called as a fixed flexion deformity well, just to repeat thomas test is basically to uncover the hip flexion deformity when the patient is having a flexion deformity of the hip you have to correct the lumbar lordosis by flexing the normal side hip when you flex the normal side hip the opposite side hip will automatically go back into its normal flex fixed flexion deformity or abnormal fixed flexion deformity and this angle is calculated to be your fixed flexion deformity so first you make the patient lie on the cot you uh, observe the lumbar lordosis then you place a hand under the uh, lumbar spine ask the patient to flex the uh, normal limb then uh, you look at the hip flexion deformity the opposite or abnormal limb and then you calculate the hip flexion deformity and this is the sequence of events that uh, take place in case of a thomas test it was a difficult question hopefully uh, some of you got it right of course it's a long time back i am trying to um, help uh, students in the future who can who are going to get these kind of questions in the exam right so the next question they asked was match the following lesion with the correct management right uh, so they have given a series of uh, lesions and they want you to match with the correct uh, management so let us look at simple bone cyst what is the treatment of choice in simple bone cyst simple bone cyst you can manage conservatively once it goes into a fracture it automatically heals and what is the pathognomic sign that you see in simple bone cyst it's called a fallen leaf sign fallen leaf sign where uh, fracture can happen and a small piece of bone is floating in the simple base bone cyst so simple bone cyst is treated by an intra lesional steroid or conservative management right then you have the giant cell tumor which you should know everything about it is epimetaphyseal in location occurs after the physis closure grows from the epiphysis towards the metaphysis it is eccentric soap bubble in appearance and it is an expansile lesion it is an aggressive type of benign lesion the treatment of choice is extended curettage and bone grafting so you would do an extended curettage and bone grafting osteoid osteoma is a very common benign tumor and uh, it occurs with the help of an idus less than two centimeters in size can occur in the cortex and it causes excruciating night pain which is relieved by salicylates the treatment of choice is radio frequency ablation or excision biopsy so the choice of treatment in this table for that is radio frequency ablation 
osteosarcoma is a heavily malignant tumor it requires wide excision about 3 to 5 centimeters of normal tissues uh, uh, bone is need, needed to be removed you have to give adjuvant chemo and radiotherapy before and after the uh, procedure so the treatment of choice for osteosarcoma is wide excision remember that so if these are the uh, treatment options and uh, this is the management of these uh, these lesions that were given in the exam so it should be a very straightforward question if you have read the uh, oncology part of or tumors part of the orthopedics portion so let's look at the next question so here a 45 year old patient came with a tibial shaft fracture in a cast he presents to the emergency department with very severe pain the cast was removed and the pain on passive flexion was seen pulses tibialis anterior and dorsalis pedis was well felt loss of sensation over the first web space was seen what is the next step in management in the first space uh, a sensation is provided by the, provided by the deep peroneal nerve it's provided by the deep peroneal nerve so all of us know the six p's for uh, compartment syndrome pain pressure paresthesia paresis pallor and pulseness pulselessness pulselessness and pallor are the last uh, uh, signs and symptoms to be elicited and therefore if you have uh, pulselessness and pallor you are already too late so the most important thing is um, pain disproportionate to the problem right patient is having excruciating pain increasing amounts of analgesics are required pain on passive stretch these are the two things that are very early in compartment syndrome have to be recognized before you have muscle damage so what do you do this is a case of clear cut case of compartment clear cut case of compartment syndrome and you have to at least measure the compartment pressure so how do you measure the compartment pressure you put in a needle and then you check for the uh, pressure so it has to be done venous doppler yes it's of no use the pulses are still intact reapply cast of course not patient is having a compartment syndrome give analgesics no because the patient is having compartment and if you don't release early there may be a loss of limb remember that and also another quirk that they keep asking in the exam is compartment syndrome need not only occur in closed fractures can occur in open fractures also even though open fractures opens the hematoma to the outside environment some amount of facial pressure can occur in other compartments so therefore you must suspect compartment pressure or compartment syndrome in open fractures as well what is a normal compartment pressure that we know of it is, should be less than 10 mm of mercury if it is more than 30 mm of mercury it is definitely compartment pressure if the bp is low then you take the delta measurement and the difference should be not more than 30 mm so you should also look at the blood pressure if the blood pressure is low the difference should not be more than 30 mm okay so the less than 10 mm is normal more than 30 mm is compartment pressure you must do a immediate compartment release if it is more than 30 mm there are four compartments in the leg all four compartments have to be released including the anterior lateral deep posterior and superficial posterior all four compartments have to be released in the leg to make sure uh, the limb survives and there is no muscle and nerve damage now let's look at the next question that they asked so following a femur shaft fracture your consultant asks you to provide tibial skeletal traction which of the following will need to do it right so apply uh, a skeletal traction what are the things that are required we can either apply for a shaft or it or neck fracture you can either apply a skin traction which is also called as a box traction or you apply a skeletal traction right with the box traction you can only put about 2 to 5 kg of weight whereas with the skeletal traction you can put 5 to 12 kg of weight so therefore the traction is more effective in case of skeletal traction and in case that is a delay in surgery or the patient presents delay to you and you want some traction uh, the skeletal traction is more uh, beneficial when you are using it in a longer term for a, or a longer duration so what are the things that you require you can't use a k wire you need to use a steam and pin in this case you need a bowler strip stirrup and then you need a bowler brown splint so you don't use a k wire because it is too thin it is just 2 or 2.5 mm in size maximum and it is too thin a durham spin is not used durham spin is commonly used in case of uh, osteoporotic individuals when you are using a calcaneal um, uh, skeletal traction that is very used it in osteoporotic individuals because the there is threading in the uh, durham spin in the middle region and therefore it holds on to the bone better so whenever you see threading 
in the middle of a Steeman pin that is a Durham pin. Thomas flint is not used here. Thomas flint is just used for transportation or to keep the limb, decrease the pain immediately after a fracture or in T case of TB hip and knee. So the things that you require are 2, 3 and 5 that is bowler stirrup, steam and pin and bowler brown splint. So these are the three things that you require for an upper, upper tibial traction. So when you apply a steam and pin, you apply in the upper tibial region from the lateral side to the medial side. Why do you do from lateral to medial side? So that when you start, you don't injure the common peroneal nerve. You know where the common peroneal nerves and you can insert from the lateral to medial side. However, if you insert from medial to lateral side, you don't cannot control where it is coming out and therefore it may injure the common peroneal nerve here, which winds around the neck of the fibula. <coughs> so therefore you have to insert the steam and pin from lateral to medial side. Then you have to put in a stirrup which is called a bowler strip, stirrup around the steam and pin and then you hang it on a bowler bonus splint, bowler brown splint with a weight and these are the three things that are required for upper tibial traction and uh, you know the K wires are thinner and they have trocar shape on both sides that is called as a K wire. If the trocar is on only one side and that is called a steam and pin. Right, so this is the difference between steam and pin and a K wire. If there is threading in the middle of the steam and pin, it is called as a Durham spin. All these questions have been asked previously in your uh, entrance exam, so you must have an understanding of this so that you get these questions right. Let's move on to the last question uh, that was asked in the uh, INICT November exam. So the question was as follows, following a road traffic accident, patient has a type 3B open fracture of the tibia. Based on the stability, arrange the following from the highest stability to the lowest stability. So you must understand that in open fractures, we cannot use a plate or an intramedullary nail because it is contaminated and therefore any foreign body that is applied inside will cause infection. It will cause infection and therefore you have to apply something from the outside and this is called as external fixator and external fixators are of various types and uh, you cannot apply a cast as well because in an open fracture there is a wound and then you have to manage the wound if you apply a cast you cannot manage the wound and therefore you have to apply from something from the outside and this is called as external fixator this is a difficult question of course but you must understand that the more hardware that we put the more number of rods that we put the more number of directions that you apply from the more stable the fixator is so that is a basic concept of how you I, I tackle this question. So even though it might have been a bouncer and a difficult question, this kind of a question can be tackled in this fashion where you understand that the more amount of uh, rods and pins and fixators you use, the more stable the fixation is. So there are three types of fixator. You have a uniplanar fixator, you have a biplanar fixator and then you have a ring fixator. Right, so you have a uniplanar fixator when you see an axial section of the tibia when the uh, pins are applied from one direction only it is called a uniplanar fixator whereas if the pins are applied in bi-directional or in two different planes in perpendicular to each other two pins are applied it is called a biplanar fixator. Uniplanar fixator can be unilateral on one side or can be bilateral when the pin goes all across the tibial shaft. Ring fixator of course is as a ring all around the, it goes around the circumference of the tibia and then you put pins across like this. This is the most stable fixator or fixation method. Biplanar is a second uh, and the uniplanar is the least um, stable fixator. So uniplanar can also be done with one connecting rod or two connecting rods like this. So two connecting rods I have said by the basic principle that the more fixators or more rods you use the more fix stable it is. So if you use two connecting rods it is more stable. Here is an example of a uniplanar whereas bilateral because the pin is going all across the bone. This is a biplanar fixator. Right? This is a multiplanar fixator within three directions one, two and three directions and this is a ring fixator. So the most stable of all these is Elizarov. So this is the most stable fixator of all. Then you have the biplanar fixator which is the second most stable. Then you have two uh, things with uniplanar fixator. The, where there is two rods that is more stable. So therefore that will be the third most stable and a uniplanar with a single rod will be the least stable. So the answer is four, sorry, the answer is three, four and two and one. So the answer, the correct answer is C. 
So even though this might have been a difficult question, but by understanding the principle that the more amount of uh, metal or implant you use, the more stable it becomes. So that principle you can use and probably would have got this question right. Okay. So with that, uh, we come to an end of uh, the recall of INICT November 2021 questions. Hopefully this helped you. Uh, always try and uh, uh, um, revise your old questions so that because these are the questions kind of questions that will come in your future exams as well. Hopefully this helped you. Please do subscribe to our channel. My name is Dr. Kanan Kumar and this is Plexus Ortho. Thank you very much.